evening, friends. It is truly a source of inspiration having this an opportunity of visiting with you in your homes by means of this television station. We hope, trust, and pray that our visit together will be of a mutual interest and that much and lasting good will be accomplished for the upbuilding of the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'd like you to study along with me this evening in the fear of the judgment to come, realizing that one day we must face God in the judgment. When we face God in the day of judgment, we will not be judged by what we thought. We will not be judged by the way we felt, but the Bible, the Word of God, will be the criteria by which we will be judged. For Jesus says in John the 12th chapter and the verses 48, Jesus says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. He said, The words that I have spoken, the same will judge him in the last day. John will exile on the Isle of Patmos. In Revelation, the chapters 20 and the verses 12, John says, And I saw the dead, small and great stand before God. He said, And the books were open, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead was judged out of those things written in the books according to their works. This lets us know that in the day of judgment, the Bible, the Word of God, will read the same. Our subject for this evening is in the form of a question. If you notice in the second chapter of the book of Genesis, and the verse is 7, the Bible says, The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This man whom God made and placed in the Garden of Eden, he violated heaven's will in that he ate of the forbidden tree and was driven out in darkness and despair and without hope. But God still loved man. And thus in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God said, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And from this time, God Almighty began to unravel a plan or a scheme of redemption whereby man could be brought back in that relationship which he lost in the Garden of Eden. And thus, about 40 centuries later, the Apostle Paul, writing to the Roman church, in Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God, under salvation unto everyone that believeth, under the Jews first and also the Greek. For therein is God's righteousness, of the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Therefore our subject for this evening is the gospel as God gave it, adapted to man as God made him. What we're trying to find out in this lesson is whether or not the gospel as given by God adequate to save the man that God made? Or is it true, as a lot of people have been led to believe, that in conviction and conversion, that God must send some supernatural power, separate, independent, apart from the Word of God, to see the heart of the sinner before he can render obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ? But I want you to keep this fact in mind, that as God's man and God's plan. And I believe by analyzing man as God made him and analyzing the plan as God gave it, we'll be able to find out whether or not the plan is sufficient to save man, whether or not the plan is adequate, whether or not it meets man's needs in this present generation. Let us notice, first of all, the average person when we begin to talk about religion, they began to pat in their bosom and say, oh, yes, I know what I've got because I have it right here. Well, friends, I'm not going to reflect upon your intelligence this evening by talking about this muscular organ that pumps the blood through the streamers of our body because God deals with man from an intellectual standpoint and not from the physical heart. Yet the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the Bible said the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So we can see that man's heart must be changed. But I wonder if he's talking about this heart or whether he's talking about man's mind. Keep this fact in mind as we analyze man. Let us notice that man, as God made him, have an intellectual ability. With this intellect, man thinks. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, And the Lord God saw 
that the weakness of man was great upon the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart. Now, I wonder if they were thinking down here or were they thinking up here. The Bible said that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was evil and that continuously. Is that all the Bible says about it? No. In the second chapter of the book of Mark, just after Jesus Christ had told the man sick of palsy, Son, thy sin be forgiven thee, take up thy bed and walk. The Bible said the Jews set their reasoning evil in their heart. And Christ said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? So we can see the heart that must be chained, that man thinks with it, that man reasons with it. Not only that, but the Bible tells us in Matthew, the 13th chapter, and the verses 15, the Bible said the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart. Now I wonder if they were understanding down here, or were they understanding here. So we've learned that man thinks with the heart that must be changed. He reasons, he understands and believes. In the eighth chapter of the book of Acts, after Philip the evangelist had preached the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch, the Bible said they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What does he be baptized? He said, If thou believe it, the Lord thine heart, thou mayest. So here was man's intellectual ability. That man thinks, he reasons, he understands and believes. But man have a willpower. And with this willpower, man plans and intends. If you ever plan to do something, where does the thought always originate? Down here or up here? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 and the verses 12, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts in tin of the heart. So with his willpower, man plan, man in tin, and man desires. In Romans chapter 10, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says, Brethren, my heart desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, have gone about to establish their own righteousness and have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So like with this willpower, man plan, man intend, man desire, and man purpose, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6, the Bible says, according as a man purpose this in his heart, so let him give. And then man obeys. In Romans chapter 6 and beginning at verse 15, the Bible said, Know ye not to whom ye yield, yourselves servants to obey. His servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin under death or obedience under righteousness. But God be thanks that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which were delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. And then man have an emotional nature. With his emotional nature, man loved. In the 19th chapter of the book of Matthew, Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, thy mind, and thy strength. Not only does that man love, but man respond to certain things because of that emotional nature. And then man rejoices because of that emotional nature. Man confides and man trusts. In Proverbs 3, 5, the Bible says, Son, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not to thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. So therefore, this is man as God made him. Intellect by which he thinks. He reasons, he understands, and believes. Willpower by which he plans, he intends, he desires, he purpose and obey. Emotional nature by which he loves, he responds, he rejoices, he confides and trusts. Now you can see this. Now keep this in mind because we'll be back to this before we conclude this lesson. Now let us notice just a moment with the gospel of Christ. First of all, we understand that Jesus Christ commissioned that the gospel be preached to every creature. In Mark, the 16th chapter, and verse 15 and 16, Jesus Christ said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now let's notice something. Christ did not tell them to go and preach a gospel. 
He didn't go and tell them to go and preach some gospel. He told them to go and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, why is it so necessary to preach the gospel? Because Paul says in Romans 1, 16, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is God's power to save the world. Now, let's look at this word power for just a moment. We understand that water is God's power to quench thirst. But you can add salt to that water, and it won't quench thirst. Bread is God's power to quell hunger. But you can add strychnine to it, and it'll kill you. So we understand that the gospel of Jesus Christ is God's power to save the world. But this gospel must be preached in its purity and its simplicity in order to save the soul. And Paul lets us know that there is only one gospel to be preached. In Galatians, the chapter is 1, and beginning at verse 6. Here the apostle Paul said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you to the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He said, well, there's not another, but there be some which trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. He said, but though we are, here when he used the personal pronoun we, he was speaking of himself and other inspired men of God. He said, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be an anathema or let him be accursed. But Paul doesn't stop there. Paul goes farther and says, as we have said before, so say I now again. He says, if any man, regardless of the number of degrees he may hold, regardless of the pigmentation of his skin, regardless of his hereditary background, regardless of his political standard, the Bible says, if any man preach any of the gospel unto you, and that you receive, let him be an anathema, or let him be accursed. So we can see there's only one to be preached. Now, what will be the end of those who fail to obey it? In First Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, the Bible says it's time that judgment began at the house of God. And if it first began at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? For the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinners appear? Well, Paul answered this question in Second Thessalonians chapter 1 and beginning at verse 6, when he said, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation of them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So we can see that there's only one gospel to be preached, that this one gospel is God's only power to save the world. Now we understand that when Paul says God's power under salvation, this means justification. It means God's only ways and means of justifying sinners and making them righteous in the sight of God. Now, the, no man could be made righteous under the law because the law made no provision for complete forgiveness of sin. And therefore, here's one thing that people need to understand, that you cannot feel and know that you're justified in the sight of God, but you must have some evidence. No lady would go downtown and buy a pattern, and a pattern calls for three and a half yards of material, and thus she go in the fabric shop and order some material, and the lady cut off a piece and say, here's your three and a half yards of material, and haven't measured it. That lady wouldn't pay for that material. She wants that material measured, and she knows she'll get what she pays for. And the only way you can know you've got two pounds of meat, it must be weighed, and the scales must be accurate. So therefore, forgiveness of sin is an executive act. It's an act which takes place in heaven in the mind of God and not on earth in the heart of man. And this being an executive act, only God has the power to forgive sin. Now, just suppose, just suppose some man over here at Jackson, Michigan, were to go down to the warden one morning, tell the warden, say, warden, let me out of this joint. I'm a free man. I'm sure I know exactly what the warden would ask that, ask that man. How do you know you're a free man? Suppose he began to pat in his bosom and say, Warden, I feel just like I'm a free man. I can feel it right here in my heart. Now, how many men you think the warden let out of prison on that kind of evidence? Now, the only way that man will ever walk out of that prison from behind those bars of free man, he must have a signed pardon. And once he receives a signed pardon, you have evidence that he's a free man. So, therefore, the only way we can know that we're saved and justified in the sight of God, we must have some evidence, and the only evidence we have is what the Bible says. Until one have complied with what the Bible says, they cannot feel, they cannot know that they're justified in the sight of God. Now let us notice, the gospel as preached by the apostles had certified facts. 
Now let us notice that the apostles on the day of Pentecost, when the first perfected gospel sermon were preached in fact, let us find out briefly just what the apostle preached, and then we'll continue this on our next investigation. The Bible says when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there was all together one place in one accord, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven, a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven a divided tongue, like as a fire set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And the Bible said there was dwelling at Jerusalem Jew devout men out of every nation under heaven. When this was gnawed abroad, the multitude came together and was confounded and said, What meaneth this? No, these speak Galilean. How will every man speak in our own tongue wherein we were born? He said, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and dwellers of Mesopotamia. Judah, Cappadocia, Polynesia, Persia, and Pamphylia, out of Egypt, Latin, about Serene, Strait, Rome, Jews, and proselytes, Priests and Arabian, do hear them speak in their own tongue the wonderful works of God. And thus they begin to talk about the patriarch David, how it both dead and best to with them until this day. But David is prophet, spake of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, how it would not leave his soul in hell. And the Bible says, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter, and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the midst of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now let us notice, we'll continue this investigation on next week. We're going to deal with the facts of the gospel, the commands of the gospel, and the promises of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're invited to attend our services at the Franklin Street Church of Christ, which meets 909 Franklin Street Southeast right here in the city of Grand Rapids, Michigan. We also have a radio program, WKWM, that's on Sunday morning at from 8 until 8.30. Until next Wednesday evening, we thank you very much for watching this program. Be watching on next Wednesday evening at the same time. Thank you very much.